Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so this uh, work is motivated by um, the observation that network outages due to misconfigurations are extremely common. And not to be picking on Google, but Google had at least two major outages just in the last two weeks. And in fact, they're so common that my roommate Jonathan, while I was preparing this talk yesterday, and this is no joke, sent me a screenshot of Google Calendar being down. So this is from yesterday. Um, so you might be wondering, why is it that these big uh, tech companies don't have their networks under control? So clearly there seems to be a problem here, right? And I think the key issue is that networks have just become so large and so complex that it's basically impossible or infeasible for a human to, to rule out all the possible cases and, and rule out that a configuration change might cause some unforeseen uh, consequences. Um, but luckily, there's a solution to this problem called network verification. And so let me show you how this works based on a small example. And so the key idea is, while this is really hard for humans to reason about, computers are much better at it. So let's use computers. And so in this example here, uh, we have a small network topology, and say we have configured it to use uh, shortest path forwarding. Um, so with a network verification tool, we would feed this configuration to, to the software, to the verification tool, together with some question about the network behavior or some property that you want uh, to verify. And so the, the verification tool will analyze the configuration, build some mathematical model of it, and come back with an answer. And it will either say, no, there seems to be something wrong here, and give you a counterexample, and then you can go back and fix your configuration and iterate, or it will say yes, and um, implicitly it will sort of have constructed a formal proof that this, is, this configuration can't go wrong, and so we can be very confident that is in indeed correct, and then install it on a real network. Um, so it looks like we're done here, right? So we have, we have these verification tools, they rule out bugs, great. Except uh, real networks uh, experience failures quite frequently. So there's things like link and device failures. And so one important class of properties we want to reason about is fault tolerance. Unfortunately, uh, the state of the art tools aren't very helpful when it comes to fault tolerance. So for example, in this case, all a verification tool could tell us here is that the packet maybe gets forwarded. So it could either get forwarded if there's no failures, or it could get dropped if there is a failure. And this is the best such a tool can do. Now, while this answer is correct, it's, it's really not helpful, right? And so this is where our uh, work comes in. So let's replace the state-of-the-art verification tool with our latest tool called MagnetCat, which is a probabilistic network verification tool. So MagnetCat is equipped to, to reason about networks in a probabilistic manner. And so it can give a much more helpful answer in this case. It can tell us, well, actually, um, the packet will take this, this path through the middle of the network, and so the probability of packet delivery is close to 98%. So this is much more useful. Um, now that we have a useful tool, let's look at a slightly more sophisticated example. Let's say that instead of just taking the shortest path, we also try to route around failures. And so in this case, what we're going to do is, if the next stop on the shortest path is, uh, fails for some reason, we'll just take a uh, random next stop among the next stops that are up uniformly at random. And let's also uh, adjust our failure model to say that, there will be, that we assume that there's at most two link failures while the, network traverses, uh, the packet traverses the network. So in this case, um, MagnetCare will tell us that uh, the probability of packet delivery will actually be one. And this is because this, this routing scheme is, is what's called too resilient. So it can tolerate two failures without any loss of packets. Okay, one thing that is very interesting about this example, if we zoom in a little bit, is that it actually contains infinite forwarding paths. So imagine that these two links here go down, and imagine that at the source we decided to take the shortest path through this middle node. Uh, now, at this point, we may, might decide with probably, uh, I think, one-third to route around this failure by going up. And at this point, again, this link is down on the shortest path, so we might route around this failure by going down here. 
And uh, now we're in a loop, and we could keep on going in this loop forever. So this might seem contradictory in the first moment. So we, can, we have these infinite forwarding loops, and yet the packet gets delivered with probability one. But if you think about it a little more, um, the probability of, of taking one iteration in this loop is strictly less than one. And so as, the, the, as we take more and more iterations, the probability gets smaller and smaller, and, and the limit, it turns out to be zero. And so in fact, with probability one, we'll eventually deliver the packet, even though the path can be arbitrarily long. Okay? And so MagnetCat knows this and, and can reason about these kind of things. Um, and, and, and so the obvious question is at this point, how do we build a verification tool that knows how to reason about these kind of limit, limits and, and probabilities in the limit? Um, so, yeah? So, uh, just a clarification. So when you say network config, do you mean like a data plane config or the control plane config, or are you just considering like software defined networks? Um, I mean a data plane config. Yeah, low level config. A static, a static configuration. Um, for in the case of MagnetCat, at least. Not, not like a DD, not a distance vector or OSB effect. No. Yeah. So your conditions also have that there's 1% probability of failure. Mm -hmm. So is this magnet cat also arguing about that, or only the, the very hardwired at most two failures? Uh, no. So it, did, uh, it, does, it does reason about both cases. So in this earlier example, we saw that the probability of delivery, so here we get a concrete number, right? Um, that depends on the, the, failure of, uh, the probability of link failure being 1%. I did my math right. Are you assuming the routing is also uh, probabilistic? Um, the, the, the routing is allowed to be probabilistic, yes. Um, so in the second example, it was in fact probabilistic. So here, uh, whenever we found that the next stop on the shortest path is blocked, is due to a failure, we'll take a random detour. A so we'd locally um, take a detour. Yeah, okay, so this is the setup, your assumption, you know, uh, what kind of natural your verification tool is called. Yes. So the, the, the routing is allowed to be uh, probabilistic. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, great. Um, so how do we do this automatically? Um, well, if you look at this, um, so imagine a packet being forwarded by such a probabilistic network. This looks a lot like a random walk, right? Uh, so at each point, uh, at each point in the network, the network somehow decides where to send the packet with some probability, and so what's happening to the packet is very much a random walk, and so we can model this uh, using the theory of Markov chains. And um, in particular, we can compute these kind of limiting distributions. Where does the packet end up in the limit uh, using, well, there's actually some closed forms for, for these solutions, and we can compute them precisely, which is quite nice. Uh, was, yeah? So, sorry to interrupt you again. I guess I'm a little bit confused. So what is the probability over? Is it over time, or is it over possible data plane instantiations? Is it over all possible traffic distributions? Uh, I'm not sure what is the probability over. So you can model different things. Uh, one possibility is that you're analyzing a static uh, data plane configuration. So one data plane configuration. And it might make uh, probabilistic choices. For example, Maybe you're, you're trying to optimize um, how, how pack, like you want to have great network utilization, so you use some randomized routing scheme. So this might be one reason why packets get forwarded in a probabilistic way. I guess, okay, I mean, imagine I'm a network operator. When you say 98%, does it mean that 98% of the time my packets go through, or does it mean that 98% of the possible Workloads I will see, I get 98%. You can reason about both those things with our tool. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't sure which one yet. Yeah. Um, both of those are possible. Um, yeah, in my example, I didn't specify. Or is it over the space of failure scenarios? Uh, both is possible, again. <laughs> it depends on whether you model it probabilistically or not, or if you pick one specific one. Yep. Is Markov chain analogy or whatever tool? I don't see how that would work in your, that at most two links fail. How do you incorporate that one? Um, right. Um, so what I didn't show you is that there is a, so the input to our tool is really a, a program in a domain-specific language. And it can express uh, things like that. Um, in some sense, you can, I mean, 
One way to model it, that is by basically, um, um, by enumeration, by basically enumerating the, the cases. So, and I'm not saying that's what our tool does, but you can sort of imagine that the first step in your Markov chain decides how many failures there are gonna be. And then, so th this would still be a Markov chain. You, you won't raise the graph size to the K if there's K failures? Uh, to, two to the K, you mean? Uh, no, so luckily, there, I mean, there's better ways of doing this, but I just wanted to get the point across that we can, we can model this as a Markov chain. So I'll, I'll talk slightly, briefly about, okay, so one challenge I think that's come up is, is the size of the state space here, right? Uh, so there's, in fact, there's some other issues. So, um, you know, the state space here is really not just the location of the packet. That's one part of the state space, and it's usually of quite manageable size. Maybe there's up to 1,000 switches or so in the network. But networks also modify packets, in, special, in particular the header fields of the packets. And the header space is, can be very, very large, right? So like if there's 160 bits in the header, um, then you have a header space of 2 to the 160. And so we have a very large Markov chain here in general. Um, yeah, so, so one challenge we face is how can we, how can we actually, I mean, we, we can sort of hope to, to represent this explicitly, right? This is, it has, is a Markov chain with more states than particles in the universe. So we have to figure out how we can um, represent it in an implementation. And I mean, the, the key observation here is that this is a very structured Markov chain. There's lots of structure we can exploit. Uh, one key property is that it's very sparse. So packets certainly don't get rewritten by the network in arbitrary ways. There's just a few sort of ways that a header might be rewritten. Um, and it also doesn't get forwarded sort of in arbitrary ways, but to one of its neighbors. And so the sparsity is, is one, one key property. And the other key uh, property is that many, most states of this, of this Markov chain are very similar because networks actually don't look at the entire uh, header of a packet to decide where to send them, but just at a few select bits. And so many packets will be treated by the network in exactly the same way. And so these are the two th main things we're gonna exploit here. Uh, I won't be able to talk about this in detail. Um, I'll refer you to the paper for the details, but the key takeaway here is that we can exploit this structure um, and that we can have clever symbolic data structures that, that model the Markov chain in a sort of yeah, symbolic way and we can uh, build a tractable tool. So very, very briefly, how do we implement this? Uh, in one slide, uh, this is what it looks like. So the input to a tool is a network model written in some domain-specific language called Pluralistic Netcat. We take it and compile it to a symbolic intermediate representation. So you can think of this as a, as a symbolic, so a very compact representation of this ginormous Markov chain um, that we can perform some analyses on. Every once in a while, we have to compute, uh, compute uh, some limit of such, a uh, of such a Markov chain. And in order to do that, we convert this representation to a sparse matrix. And then we can run a optimized sparse linear solver. And they, these, these solvers are very efficient. Um, and then we can convert back and forth between these two representations. And at the end of the day, once we have this very explicit representation, it's fairly easy to write code that analyzes these representations. We can do that either using standard uh, linear algebra tools to analyze this matrix, or we also wrote some code to, to analyze this um, symbolic representation and do the analysis on that. So at a very high level, this is how it works. Please look at the paper for the details. Um, so let me show you very briefly how this performs in practice. Uh, so here we um, applied this tool to a data center topology called FatTree. So this is a very common uh, data center topology um, with an ECMP configuration. Um, so we can see that this can scale to very large networks. There is quite a bit of cost to modeling failures. So in fact, we currently do have an exponential in there that's a weakness in the implementation that could be improved. Um, and so, but, but we can still go to more than a hundred, uh, you know, a network with more than a thousand hosts. So scale quite well. Um, another thing that I didn't mention yet is that this is very amenable to parallelization. So this helps quite a bit with speeding it up. Um, so you can see that if we run this on 40 cores in parallel, we'll get almost optimal speed up, 30x speed up. Um, it depends a little bit on the kind of an analysis we do on the topology and the, the workload, but in general, we get very good speed ups. 
Um, so we evaluate, uh, we evaluated this in detail. We also compared to state of the art and showed that this is quite an improvement over what was there. And we also did a, a intensive or uh, a long case case study to to show how this tool can be used to um, evaluate it to evaluate an algorithm that was proposed in the literature. So please go look at the paper for the details there. Um, so let me summarize really quick. Um, MagnetCat is the first scalable verification tool for probabilistic networks. And um, because it's a probabilistic network verification tool, it can reason, for example, about things like fault tolerance, which is in contrast to previous work. Uh, it's based on the theory of Markov chain, so this provides a nice uh, mathematical foundation. Um, everything we do is quite rigorous, and it, in, from a practical perspective, allows us to uh, compute these limits in closed form. Um, I should say that in the implementation, we approximate these limits, right? We use uh, linear solvers, but it's good to at least have a mathematical theory that is precise, and, um, and then we can do approximation, leave that to the experts, essentially. Um, so we're able to make this scale to really large networks, thanks to the sparsity of the Markov chains and the symbolic data structures we developed. Um, we can parallelize things very nicely. That gives a good speed up, and we use optimized linear algebra solvers uh, to compute the closed forms. Um, so with that, um, thank you, and yeah, the code is available if you're interested, and so is the paper. Yeah. So if your policy is that you forward to a random link that's not down, and your failure model is what you had on the slide, 1% one probability, one probability of failure, mm -hmm. Then I believe the question whether your packet has a probability of making it to the, or will make it to the end, that depends whether this network stayed connected and that's, that's sharply complete. So how do you analyze something that's sharply complete? Yeah, I mean, our verification, it, so our verification problem is hard. Um, that's, well, if you see on this graph, so, you know, at some points things do get exponential here. That's fine as long as we can push this far enough. Um, I mean, this was for NetCat, for example. Um, the decision pr procedure is p-space complete, yet we can sort of, in, in practice it often uh, scales far enough that that's fine. Um, I should say that uh, in this particular model, we actually assumed that, um, that links fail sort of after each hop. Uh, so, so basically, after each hop, you decide which, which of the neighboring links are up or down. Uh, and and so, so, so that, that's why it scales a bit better. So it's not that we decide for all links sort of ahead of time which links are up or down probabilistically, but after each step, um, we model it as sort of a local uh, uh, probabilistic choice. So you mean if you get back to the same node, yeah. if a, a link was down in a second ago, it's not going to be done anymore? Yeah, yes. so this is one trick we use in this case. That, that would certainly that, help. That helps. <laughs> it does help. Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple of things. One is a question and one is one of the questions. Okay. Uh, I have a question and then maybe a suggestion. So I guess the question is more about, uh, so, I mean, you have a Markov chain, right? I think the other thing, sort of the, the simple systems answer is just run a Monte Carlo simulation and see what it tells me. So do you have any research showing the value of this verification over just a simulation and saying, oh, whatever in my simulation, I got 96% of the time. It, it went through and then I'm done. And the simulation is obviously massively parallelizable, just like you are parallelizable, probably even more so. Um, I mean, there's so what's the value of verification over a simulation? Um, well, I can miss, I mean, one of, one, one of the points here is that we don't want to miss corner cases, right? Um, so, So this is sort of a general tool, right? So it, it allows you to, to, to do this probabilistic reasoning if you're interested in numeric values, but also allows you to tell, to say things like every packet, literally every packet gets delivered or something like this. So, so, there, so in these, in these, quantita uh, in these qu uh, qualitative cases, it really makes a difference whether you're running a simulation or you have a verification tool. Um, but, but that being said, I mean, I'm, I'm not against simulation. You should use whichever is more appropriate to achieve I guess the other sort of more, not a question, but more of a suggestion was, I think if you looked at things like sort of optics or wireless, this makes a lot more sense. They probably talked in one year, right? If you have like uh, optics with errors and so on, 
this would make a lot more sense than like failures and so on. Because there, I think there are like physical layer yeah, properties. Really think that's a better application. Yeah. That could be a that could be a cool killer app for what you're developing here. Because mm -hmm. there, I think you have these sort of physical layer properties that have like errors. Yeah. Reasonably small, but still errors. And having that sort of confidence uh, with SNR type properties will actually be very useful for those operators. And that's a community that we typically don't talk to. Uh, I should talk to Monia. You mean corruption? <laughs> Sorry? You mean corruption? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a different kind of probability, different kind of error rate, and I think this, this might be a cool killer app for that. For that thing here. Okay, thanks, yeah. Yeah? Any other questions? Thanks, Dan. No, no, I just suggest that you show the bayonet. The we should go to drop. We should go to drop. No, I don't want to do that. Okay. I'm just curious that finally, what's your conclusion you make? So, are you making a firm conclusion 100% the probability can be reached, or you, you, you're saying 99% of some high probability that the probability? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I mean, the, what's the conclusion of the tool? The conclusion too is give you a 100% confidence or just some high probability. Um, so the tool can do yeah. both? For example, you verify reachability, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, if the tool gave us is 100% yeah. probability. <coughs> So there were two examples. In, which, in one case, it was actually 100% probability, and the tool can tell you that with confidence. And in the other case, it was with high probability. And I mean, this just depends on the kind of property you're interested in. Sometimes it's maybe failure is completely unacceptable, and you want to make sure that no matter what happens, you know, for example, every packet goes through a fire, firewall or something like that. But in other cases, it's acceptable that a small fraction of traffic gets dropped, for example. I'm so curious, you know, how is it useful if you give me a, what, not, a 99 chance that it will succeed, and uh, the 1 percent make me worry. So, I mean, <laughs> this is available, oh, I think. You know, this will be your availability, right? 99 percent of your reachability. But, so your yeah, system but is available. But it depends 90%. on what kind of problem it is. So if you tell me 99 percent is then it still means that you know, the operator need to prepare for the disaster. <laughs> right. Um, so, so the tool would allow you to design better algorithms and show that they, they have better performance, right? So that, that's one of the ideas. I assumed a very high failure rate for illustration purposes, but luckily it's not that bad. Maybe you should discuss how many people are on call. <laughs> 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 if you have 95% again, I'll say that. Just to give you an example, right? So we, we spend a lot of time to prevent the disaster, you know, that happened every two years. Yeah. Right? So it's. Why do you have to? Okay, let's say for the first time. Thanks again.